making the LF system bootable. So we're coming close to a point where we're going to have to um, write the partition that we're operating on. If you remember, it's a virtual uh, partition effectively because it's in a file. We're going to have to write it back to the USB before we can actually configure the USB to be bootable. Um, but before we do that, we'll just go into creating the etc fs tab file. Now what I'll do first is I'll copy this in here to create a default template and then I'm going to edit it in Fire. Now if you remember we haven't got a swap drive because we're on a USB stick so I'm not going to delete that because it'd be handy to have, we do need a swap, I don't have to uh, remember what the parameters are so I'm just going to remark that out by putting a hash in. Um, the bit we do need to modify is this part here and this is the root partition. Now one problem is is if we plug this USB device into a computer we don't know what device is going to be allocated. It could be allocated the first one, dev SDA, um, which it would in this case for this machine. Um, but on another machine with um, SD devices, it might get something like SDC or SDD and it wouldn't boot. So what we need to do is to find another way to let this to boot, let this boot. And what we can do is we can use uh, UUIDs which are based on the partition. So what we can do is run a command called block ID and that lists all the partitions on the system and their associated UUIDs. So this is universal, I think it's universally unique identifier, I think it stands for UUID. And you can see dev SDA, which is df minus h. Um, Right, okay, it's not show, that's showing the raw device. Dev SDA, there's our image, our USB. We need to, um, in fact, I should be able to do block ID on this, I think. Let me try that. Because I'm not sure if this is a real device. It's still plugged in, so it could still be the real device that's plugged in. But if I do block ID on this, it's not in this list. Yes, it's come back with exactly the same UUID. So irrespective of whether that is the real um, device or not, which I believe it must be, um, at least the UUID is the same, which it must be because we copied the image that we're writing or creating LFS on from the USB stick, so it has to be the same. We've not reformatted at all at any point. So it does have to be the same. So now we've got that UUID, what I can do is go back into ETC FS tab, modify it, and what I do is delete all of this. And if I do I for insert and type in UUID equals, and then paste in that long string just remove some of these spaces. That tells it where to mount it, so that means it's on the root. And we need to tell it that the file system is an ext4, which is what that bit's for. And we can just leave the rest as they are. So that should be sufficient to get the uh, partition recognized for booting. Um, there's some information there about uh, NCQ uh, making EXT3 file systems reliable across power failures. Um, so if you decide to use EXT for any reason, then that um, is something you'll need to read. But now go on to generating the kernel. 
So we need to go back to our sources directory, extract the kernel. And then we can change into it. Run this first command to ensure that the source directory is clean. And then we can run make menu config, which will go into a nice menu to modify the settings in the kernel. First thing I would recommend to do is to run a target called make def config and that creates a nice set of default configs based on the architecture that we're on. So as you can see it's created some defaults for the Intel 64-bit architecture. And now if I run make menu config it should load those defaults that have been created and we can just make a few changes here. There's some hints here if you're unsure about um, creating your own kernel on my YouTube channel. I've got a playlist with a set of videos um, about customizing your own kernel um, as it can be quite detailed. Um, so is this one here building a custom kernel and that goes through all the steps you need to build a kernel. But for now, I'll just go through some of the defaults they recommend to set up here. So the first one's under general setup, which is the first menu entry. And we've got to look for enable kernel headers through syskernel kheaders tile.gz. It's recommending that we disable that. So let's look for that. Right, so it's already disabled, so that's okay. Device drivers. Graphic support is normally about a page or so down. Yeah, there it is, at the bottom. Frame buffer devices. I think that's near the bottom. Yeah. And add support for frame buffer devices. doesn't say to specify there's actually an arrow at the end of that which means that there's more there's a further menu underneath but it doesn't actually recommend or specify selecting anything there so we'll just leave that as it is we've then got to go into generic driver options I'm not sure where that is there it is at the top so we don't want support for your event helper and we do want maintain dev temp fs file system to mount a dev so that's fine. Um, one other thing that I've been bitten by recently is the fact that when you run a default kernel um, under power management, yeah, and here under frequency scaling, it defaults the user space, and the default user space is to run the CPU at the lowest possible clock frequency. So what I would recommend here is that you set this to performance. Um, you could set power save actually, which means that it will use less power um, when the machine is not under use. Um, but if you're going to be using LFS to do some more compiling, you probably want to use performance. Uh, so I'm going to set performance. And that should be it. Um, you may want to go back and tune this even more. Oh, with the Alder Lake architecture, currently the kernel is not fully optimized for the Alder Lake, Intel Alder Lake architecture. Um, there's no support for the thread director at the moment, but there's a, a workaround where there's a setting um, I forgot to remember where it is. Yeah, this one here, cluster scheduler support. This needs to be disabled for um, Alder Lake. Um, what it does by disabling it, it means the kernel can identify the 
cores with the highest clock rate and try and optimize heavy workloads to be put on those cores rather than um, assuming that all cores run at the same speed which is what will happen if that settings left at the default set setting so that should be enough uh, for the configuration there's a default configuration like I say I could probably go in there and spend a lot more time tuning the kernel a lot more finely but what I've done there for now should be sufficient so what I'm going to do now is to run make I'll time this see how long this takes um, actually I'm not sure if this runs on all cores or not let's get yeah looks like it is so of course make respects make flags and make flags is set so it is running on all cores so this only takes about a minute or so to finish Okay, so that's built. Now we install the modules. So there were some settings there that were modularized, 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 yeah. Um, and now we need to copy the kernel to the boot directory. Um, one thing should mention if you have created a separate boot partition you need to mount it now um, with this command in the host system it says there. I don't think it really matters where you do it but they've specified to do it in the host system and there's probably a very good reason for that so um, that would be my recommendation to do it that way as they've specified. Um, as you know I'm not using a separate boot partition so I couldn't copy this straight away into the boot directory we need to copy the system.map and also it's good to copy the config file as well install some documentation onto the system and it says in many case, cases the configuration of the kernel needs to be updated for packages that will be installed later in VLFS um, and there are quite a few updates that have to be done for certain packages so if the kernel source is going to be tree is going to be retained run chone r00 on the linux 5.16.9 directory so we can do that like this and I would definitely recommend keeping it because the chances are you have to make some tweaks and modifications and depending on where the modifications are only those parts will be built so it will build a lot quicker um, sometimes you make settings that affect all parts of the kernel and the whole lot gets built or virtually the whole lot but it is handy just to keep it lying around you've got a copy of the config in there already you don't have to touch anything else apart from the bit you're tweaking there's a couple of warnings there about placing the kernel source in a different place uh, user source Linux um, and there's something there about the include directory as well configuring configuring module load order um, it's been a long time since I've had to explicitly explicitly create a module in entry in mod probe um, a lot of it's automatic now although I believe there are still some situations where you would need to specify a module to load at boot time and this explains how to do it here so generally wouldn't need to do that so now we're on to grub and um, setting up the boot process now it says here about creating a an ISO to boot from as a rescue disk it's good that they've got this in the book because it shows you how you can create your own um, 
system to boot from, a grub system. Um, I tend to question whether it's absolutely necessary because to build Linux, uh, Linux from scratch, you need a host system, and obviously that host system is bootable. So whether you boot from a live um, CD, DVD, USB image, or whether you've booted a working system like I've done, <clears throat> you can always reboot that that system and use that as a rescue image to uh, tinker with your Linux from scratch uh, installation to get it to work if, if it doesn't boot correctly. Um, but yeah, it's good that the information's there anyway. So before I go ahead and do this, if I did this now, this will write it to the USB stick, but there's nothing on the USB stick. If you remember, it's empty. There's only an empty partition on there. So what we've got to do next is to come out of the truth. I'm going to have to unmount all the virtual file systems um, unmounts the loop back copy the image to the USB and then remount everything um, and then carry on with the remainder of the uh, this chapter getting the system bootable and this is effectively the last last part of the uh, the installation so I'm going to do control D to come out of the troot. I'm going to check all the mounts I've got and unmount them one at a time. So unmount that directory, that one, that one, that one, and that one. So they've all unmounted. I'll just check that again. Yep. So now all I've got left is the actual partition that's mounted at MNT LFS. So I'll unmount that. Okay, so this target is busy because we're in it. So I'll move out of it. And that's gone. So now I should be in a position to unmount this file. Um, because it's currently mounted as a loopback device, so I do low setup minus D slash dev slash loop zero. Okay, and now if I go to home kernel text, and there's the disk there, and you can see its date and time is current, so it's just been written to as we're closing stuff down. Um, let's try LSOF to see if there's any open file handles on it. Oh, right. I thought you could use this on files. Obviously not. Okay, maybe I didn't do that right. Um, let's just check mount then. There shouldn't be anything left on mount. No, there isn't. So I think I can copy that directly to the USB stick. So I'm just going to do an FDIS-L to ensure I know that I'm talking to the right device. So this looks the right device. It's the right size. It is a SanDisk USB. Right, so what I'm going to do is to time dd with the in file in file equals home kernel text lfs disk and the out file is going to be the USB stick so that will be dev sda so it's important to get that right else the um, there's a potential that you could overwrite your host system and you can use a block size 64k and put in status equals progress to monitor how well or how it goes um, it's going to take a number of minutes probably about 10 15 minutes possibly longer um, it'll look fast initially as the buffers fill up but then just got to wait for 
all the bytes to be written to USB. So I'll start that off now.
Okay, so I should be ready to press F8 in a minute to... Intercept the startup. There's the splash screen. And yep, there's the USB. Press enter. And there's the grub boot. So it says LFS 11. So we know it's the correct one. Press enter. And hopefully it will boot. And unfortunately not. It looks like it can't read any partitions. It looks like it can't see any of the disks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to press the reset button to get out of that. So I select USB again. What I'm going to do is let it boot into the grub menu. Press C for a command prompt. I'm going to do set root as equals and bracket HD. So it can see three disks, so that's good. Let's see what disk one is. Ah, right, it might need to be specified as HD0 MS DOS one. So let's do MS DOS. One um, kernel is it no Linux forward slash boot VM Linux RO and because I don't know that long string I'm just going to explicitly set dev sda one and that should boot okay. So all I need to do, I think, is to modify, I assume this is going to boot, find out in a minute, is modify the grub, so it says MS-DOS1. Yeah, that's, oh no, it's still failed. Okay, so it looks like it's not seeing the USB sticks, and maybe the USB port hasn't been initialized correctly. Right, while that is booting, I just remembered that USB controllers need a little bit of settle time. They don't initialize as quickly as um, hard disk controllers do. And also, I was reading a little bit earlier on when I was preparing to do the um, work for the boot that the UUID um, doesn't actually work. Uh, work on the kernel command line. Um, so what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to boot into the USB again, just do a couple of tests. I'm going to edit this. I'm going to add in uh, at the end of this a command called root delay, um, and of course there's a delay while I'm typing this anyway. But I'll put in five seconds. Now this will test that the USB comes up and it will also test to see whether the UUID really does work or not. So I'm going to do Control X to boot that. Yes, it's come up with other devices, so it definitely needs a delay, but also, yes, it's proved that the UUID doesn't work. And you can see at the top there, there's the SDA, there's the USB um, partition. So I'm going to press the reset button again. Modify the boot again. I'll have to press F8 to trap the boot menu. So there's the splash screen and there's the boot menu. So I'll start it up and do an edit. Go to the end, I'll put the root delay, even though it's probably academic at the moment because there's a delay while I'm typing this. And I'll remove 
the UUID and put in slash dev slash SDA1 the control X to boot and let's see yes that is now booting so there's obviously a couple of problems there booting is always the thing that catches me out um, there's so many different permutations hardware and so on so I'm going to log in as root and straight away I'm going to modify the grub config I'm going to remove this UUID insert slash dev slash SDA one and add in I'll see if five seconds is long enough it might not be might have to change it to ten seconds um, and I'll save that come out to control or delete and this time the only buttons I'm going to press while it's booting is press the F8 to trap the boot menu so it should be appearing any moment on the splash screen there it is, wait for the boot menu to come up so press enter for the USB, I'm not going to touch anything just let everything happen automatically Wait for this countdown. So that looks good. That looks like that delay of five seconds was enough. It might be possible to reduce that even more. And there it is booting successfully at last. So again, I'll log in. And you can see that um, if I do a cat etc lfs release, there's the lfs release file lsb release, there's the information in that and os release, there's the information in that one I can do cd to sources there's all the source files cd into linux and there's the linux sources that I've built the stuff from also um, I list the uh, sorry not the boot the root you can see there's all the file structure there that we've built up as well and if I do a df minus h you can see it's taken roughly about 3.3 .3 gig remembering that I think the Linux sources take up roughly one gigabyte uh, let's see what it is uh, am I in the Linux yep okay nearly two gigabytes so it's just over a gigabyte in size the system without the source files for the kernel so that's it for installing building and installing Linux uh, from scratch 11.1 .1. hope you've enjoyed the video and appreciate the thumbs up if you found it useful or interesting even and subscribe to my channel to get to hear about all my other videos that I'll be producing goodbye